Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'll get started shortly. I'll just give people a little more time to join the Zoom. Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited to be hosting Reorg's first webinar focusing on the CLO market. Uh, my name is Hugh Minch. I'm a deputy editor at Reorg. Uh, please note that a replay of this webinar will be available uh, on the Reorg webinars and podcast page within 24 hours for Reorg customers. We also will have a Q&A at the end of this webinar and you can submit questions to the panel using the Q&A widget located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have three excellent guests here today, um, and I'd like to begin by asking each of you to introduce yourselves, and could I also ask you to please tell the audience where in the CLO universe you're invested in? Um, John, would you like to start things off? Yeah, sure, John Kirshner. I'm a portfolio manager and uh, head of US Securitized Products here at Janice Henderson. Uh, portfolio manager on our CLO ETFs, including JAAA and JBBB. Um, we tend to be mostly top of the capital stack, but also some in the middle. Um, don't really play in the equity part of the capital stack, at least not yet. Thanks, John. Uh, Matt Layton. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, Matt Layton from Pearl Diver. Um, I'm a partner here. I've been here for 15, 15 odd years. Um, we um, gen generally focus on the junior uh, mezzanine tranches and the equity tranches, so triple B and below, really. Um, we're based in London, um, but we invest globally, which means um, we are kind of neutral, in fact. So roughly 80 percent US, 20 percent Europe. So we take a global view of the CLO market. Thanks, Matt. Um, and Megan Messina. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Megan Messina. I am a managing director and head of capital markets here at Oak Tree. Um, at Oak Tree, we are a CLO issuer, both in the US and in Europe. Um, and we have um, a tranche investing team as well that focuses on really the entire capital structure, um, probably except for AAAs, um, more so single A down through equity. Thank you very much. So I'll start uh, by bringing up some CLO market statistics. Uh, new issue CLO volumes in the US this year are currently just trailing 100 billion. That's a combination of both uh, broadly syndicated loan CLOs and private credit CLOs. Um, I'd expect the 100 billion threshold to probably be crossed at some point this week. Um, that's a fairly robust number, especially uh, given the limited new issue activity in the leveraged loan market. But it is a decrease of around 24% uh, from the same period in 2022. Um, CLO spreads have tightened this year. Triple A's averaged in the low 190s in the first quarter of 2023, uh, but around 176 basis points in October. Uh, that said, every rating band in the CLO structure widened through the last month um, after a sell off in the secondary and increased issuance in primary. Uh, so AAA is widened by around eight basis points in October, double B's by around 95 basis points. Uh, the European market's been fairly quiet of late in primary, uh, but we're reporting that there are nine new issues expected to price in the next three weeks. Uh, so we expect to pick up in primary activity across the pond as well. Um, so it's a complicated picture. Uh, Megan, perhaps if I could start with you, can you help us uh, make sense of the state of the CLO market and where things currently are? Yeah, happy to. Um, that is a very layered question, Hugh, um, but I'll do my best. Um, so we have seen an interesting year in, in new issue CLOs. Um, you know, a lot of headlines about the market being um, down as compared to years prior. Um, I think it's been a very healthy market. Um, we'll, you know, end the year being over 100 billion, which is incredibly healthy. I think that when we have years like 2021 or kind of these balloon years, you know, they they tend to cause uh, balloons in the asset side, and so um, I'm I'm very much okay with with lower or more regular issuance years. Um, as far as spreads are concerned, um, we've seen 
um, probably a uh, an absence of some of our um, typical CLO tranche investors, particularly in AAAs. Um, but with that said, there have been new investors that have filled in um, the holes. Um, so I think we all know that the big money center banks have been um, absent from the market this year for the most part. Um, and we have seen kind of a bigger uh, inclusion of global investors in the AAA space. And then um, there has been uh, very good demand for um, MES, particularly single A's down um, through double B's. Um, you, you already pointed out that spreads tighten throughout the year. And now we're seeing widening again, which is very typical in CLOs into the end of the year as investors kind of come to the end of their budgets. Um, and, uh, um, it, you know, I think probably every year that I've been in the CLO market and I'm going on 20, I'm, I'm uh, kind of embarrassed to admit next year is my 20th anniversary in CLOs. Um, we've seen widening into the end of the year. So um, that's that's my kind of quick recap on the state of the market. Thanks, Megan. Uh, Matt, if I could come to you next, uh, what's what's uh, your broad strokes overview of the market, where things are today? Are you uh, broadly in agreement with what Megan said? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. Given the economic headwinds, I think the issuance volumes are, are really, really quite healthy. And you can't have a situation where every single year issuance beats the previous year. Like the, 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 the issuance levels that we've had this year are above average for post-GFC period. Um, we've had, I think, uh, 143 managers issue so far this year as well. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about managers. That's seven more than last year across 272 transactions. It's not a it's not a stagnant market. Um, it's actually it's actually held up very, very well. And the headwinds, you know, we've spoken a lot about um, at the underlying loan level downgrades, um, you know, where defaults are going to go, et cetera, et cetera. The truth is we're almost two years into this period, this cycle at the moment that really started kind of February 2022. Um, and the industry on the whole, managers have been able to sort of manage against the the, the walls of, of downgrades that was certainly, you know, there was a pace last year and at, at, at the start of this year, they've done very, very well. Um, and I think that, you know, just given given kind of what we were expecting versus where we are today, default rates could have been a lot higher, triple C buckets could have been a lot higher and so on and so forth. So I actually think, 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 think this has been a pretty good year. The other area I would focus on as well, um, just to add, you know, primary issuance, as, as we spoke about, you have slightly less paper, but still a very healthy amount traded in the secondary market. Um, and it often gets neglected and, 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 and people don't talk about that so much, um, maybe because the data is a little bit more difficult to come by. But secondary trading levels, um, volumes have been have been very, very healthy. Um, all the way down through to equity, and we're seeing that seeing it this week as well. So it's not just about it's been a you know a relatively robust robust given the environment pipeline um, and level of issuance in the primary market. The secondary market has been relatively liquid um, and 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 has continued to function very well as well. Uh, John, anything to add to that in terms of the uh, overview of where things are in CLOs currently? Yeah, not not too much uh, to add there, Hugh. I, I second kind of what the comments were made. Um, I think it is important um, to understand that, yeah, the market can't keep uh, accelerating growth forever. I actually think the supply so far this year is relatively healthy, particularly in a market where the ARB has been relatively challenged um, to see this much issuance. And a lot of that has come in the last couple of months. Uh, throughout the summer months, uh, issuance was actually quite light with, you know, like somewhere around kind of high single digits, low double digit type deals per month. And now that's ramped up. Um, I th think if last year taught us in anything in fixed income was that the technicals really matter. I mean, normally money managers roughly get 100 to 200 billion of new inflows a quarter. Last year that was turned on its head and they were actually getting withdrawals. And yes, money managers aren't the only buyers here. Um, but as Megan said, like banks have kind of maybe not completely exited, but but withdrawn from the market a little bit. So money managers are kind of the marginal buyer. And when money managers are getting withdrawals instead of um, new money uh, inflows, it, it really kind of affects uh, obviously the buying power and that 
um, effect spreads. This year, it's been better for money managers um, as uh, the sell-off wasn't as bad until relative rec relatively recently as far as rates go. But now we're starting to see withdrawals as well. So um, my overall view is right now, um, spreads are, yes, they've tightened. I agree. The risk seems a little iffy here going into year end, particularly with, we'll see what the Fed says today, but the Fed's you know, still maybe not done. And I think people, um, particularly when they look at the cross asset classes and corporate credit starting to widen, that makes them more cautious on CLOs. Um, so everyone touched on the leverage loan market fundamentals to an extent. And I wanted to reference some analysis um, that our fundamentals team at Real put out last week. Uh, they found that loan and high yield issuers seen their annualized cost of debt increase by 200 basis points since the fourth quarter of 2021. Um, and that's had a larger impact on credit metrics than inflation or slower economic growth. Um, they also found that companies' interest coverage ratios have fallen 25% uh, over the last six quarters. And um, Chapter 11 filings are up 90% this year compared to 2022. Uh, so clearly, the higher for longer rates, in, rates environment is having an impact. Um, Megan, maybe if I start with you once again, um, how do you think um, CLO managers are faring in this environment? Do you, do you recognize those numbers that I, I just read out? And um, yeah, what are, the, what are the risks for managers uh, given the higher for longer rates um, that we're expecting? Um, so yeah, I do recognize the numbers, certainly. Um, and I think that CLO managers um, on the whole have done a great job. Um, you know, going into 2022, we saw managers really focused on par build um, in the portfolio. Um, and, you know, all of these, all of this data is, uh, is available to see, right? So, um, you know, we across CLO managers, um, we saw a focus on, on par building. Uh, we saw um, a, an attempt at, at a, a reduction in triple C's. I mean, that is a tough fight to uh, a tough battle to fight um, when the rating agencies are very front footed um, to avoid, um, you know, being criticized for not downgrading, downgrading quick enough. So, um, you know, triple C's have increased, um, but I think that um, they have been um, kind of, you know, slower in CLO portfolios than I would have expected at this point. Um, and, uh, and the bar, the par building certainly helps with not only triple C downgrades, but, you know, losses in the portfolio and, and, uh, erosion to the OC, uh, ratio. So, um, that, that's all good news. I think that, um, going into next year, we're expecting more volatility. Um, I mean, it, I, only in the second quarter did we start seeing uh, cracks in credit um, with second quarter earnings. I think third quarter earnings coming out now uh, will be very telling. Um, and 5% in 14 months, I mean, you can't avoid it, right? It's it's going to come back. It's going to get you. So um, the good thing, if you know, <laughs> we're credit people, so we don't often focus on the silver lining, but if there is one, um, it's, it's, uh, it's not difficult to see in your portfolio how a rapid uh, rise in interest rates in a very short period of time is going to affect your portfolio companies. Um, and so that's the good news. Um, it's pretty transparent. The risks have been revealed, as uh, Madeline Jones likes to Madeline Jones likes to say, our PM in Europe. Um, so uh, so that's the good news. But I think that you know CLO managers will have to stay vigilant um, and you know actively trade the portfolio and continue you know building par. You know one trend quickly um, amongst CLO managers has been portfolio trading to build par. Not only pair you know pair trades and also portfolio trades, um, and so that's been very effective as well. Uh, John, do you have anything to add to that? Any, any thoughts on um, the leverage on market fundamentals? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we have a whole team here of, of credit analysts looking at the leverage loan market. Um, obviously, um, my role and my team's role is more focused on the CLO market. Um, and uh, Megan's really the expert on, on credit here. But I will say, it's, you know, one thing we like about this that the cracks are starting to show is that it's been too easy of a credit market over the last few years, really since we came out of COVID, right? Um, it's been low rates until relatively recently. And then at least in the US, 
very high economic growth. And so, you know, this has been the most forecasted recession in the history of, of US, uh, the U.S. economy, and it just hasn't happened yet. In fact, we're just coming off of uh, third quarter growth of 4.9%. You know, it's almost just the opposite of what people were expecting. And that has really helped kind of hide uh, some of the weaker players in this market, notwithstanding the increase in rates. We think, um, you know, we've been calling for this for a while, as most people that growth will slow next year, uh, the cracks will become bigger, you will have more bankruptcies, um, you will have uh, probably even more important um, credits that leverage loan players that uh, in increasingly go down in price. But the nice thing and why we're so fixated on the CLO market is the, you know, you basically have three layers of protection to insulate you from those um, defaults and, and those price declines. The first first love layer of protection comes from the CLO manager themselves. Um, we tend to spend countless hours picking good managers out there, doing due diligence, making sure our view of the world aligns with theirs. Um, second is the structure of the CLO. There's all sorts of triggers in place and obviously credit enhancement to protect CLO investors. And then third, you have us as the CLO ETF manager, again, doing that due diligence and, and picking good um, CLOs to go into the ETF. So I think um, people that, you know, normally in the past, uh, if they wanted floating rate type exposure, when the Fed was raising rates, they'd go out and buy a leveraged loan ETF or, or 40 Act fund. And that's worked. Um, this year, it's, a, it's very different because the economy is not accelerating, or at least uh, we don't think it will continue to accelerate. It will slow down those cracks will show and that three layers of protection you get in CLOs will definitely come to the fore and help protect investors. Um, Matt, how do you see the managers that you're invested in? Um, how are they how are they coping with this uh, higher for longer rates environment? Well, um, so Morgan Stanley produced a report the other day, if I'm allowed to say that. I think we're currently less than 1% of all outstanding US CLOs are breaching their junior OC test. But that's that's pretty amazing given, you know, we're talking about the fact that 40% of CLOs are actually, you know, in a, in a period where they're going static. This is not sort of leaning towards the cleaner, newer, newly issued CLOs. And I think that that tells you kind of a lot about, you know, to John's point, the CLO structure. If, you, if you're talking about triple Cs, We've seen triple C buckets go up for sure, but we we run a huge amount of analysis, stress testing. For those who are less familiar, the CLO is permitted to take up to seven and a half percent or have up to seven and a half percent triple C's in its portfolio that it can carry at 100 or par. Once it exceeds that, say it's 10 percent, it has to carry the excess two and a half percent at the current market price for those for those loans. Those loans are usually heavily discounted. So it impacts your over collateralization test. We stress test this very often. You'll see CLOs can take 10, 12, 13, 14. We've even seen 17 percent triple C's before there's an OC test breach. Like just because a CLO has exceeded his bucket doesn't mean that CLO is automatically in a case of absolute distress. It's not. So just 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 to get that point off. And then to coming back and talking a little bit more about sort of, you know, what we're seeing at, at, at the corporate level, you said free cash flow coverage is down. Looking at the the, the Morningstar data there, we're looking at around a 3.4, 3.5 times coverage still. It's come down that 25% that you quoted there off of a really high base that it's really been chipping away since last year. And actually, if you if you look at the operating companies, they are, they are now more used to being in this higher interest rate environment. 2022 rates just skyrocketed. OK, every time we got inflation data, it came out worse than what we expected. It was jumping and, and rates were jumping, you know, in order to in order to keep up. Companies were having to operate in this environment. They've kind of recalibrated now. They're used to operating in this environment. There's knock on effects here, less capex spend and so on and so forth. Companies cutting costs, but they are operating in this environment now for 18 months plus and have become more kind of used to it. You also tend to see a front end loading of defaults in any cycle. 
The default rate today is 1.3%. Okay, recoveries are lower than long-term, but actually the long-term default rate, the long-term average default rate is about 2.83%. So even taking into consideration the lower recoveries, the loss rate that CLOs are experiencing today in this you know, very challenging environment where everybody's talking about defaults, downgrades, and so on and so forth, is the loss rate is basically the long-term average. That's what CLOs are designed to be able to you know, function in, right? Even CLO equity, you don't even need to go up in, in the tranches to gain protection there. So you know, I think CLO managers are, are, are doing well. Um, and you look at the pace of downgrades as well. Like we came into this year, I think the downgrade to upgrade ratio was like 3.7. It's now it's slowed by two thirds. The managers have done a great job, but um, you know the kind of the wall of downgrades that have been coming at them has plateaued. They've probably done they've they're, they're through the hardest yards. Um, I'm not saying the environment is going to be easy going forward, but there's a there's a there, there was a big it kind of felt post post the invasion last year. You know, we were talking about downgrades, defaults, everything, and everybody starts to put these things into into a bucket. Right? It's going to it's either GFC or it's COVID. Like this is not that kind of environment. We've got some inflation, we've got some difficulties, sticky inflation, so on and so forth. And there's a whole bunch of geopolitical issues that you know, you know, we don't have answers to here. But actually, it's not a crisis situation. It's is it even going to be a recession? You know, it's, it certainly doesn't look like it at, at the moment. It's a sticky inflation environment with high in, higher interest rates than, than folks have been used to for the last 10, 10 years or so. OK, but it's adaptable. It's manageable. And CLOs are, 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 you know, they're 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 working their way through this. And actually, I do think the hard yards were the last probably 15 months. And I think it's going to remain challenging, but not impossible. Thanks, Matt. Um, John, I want to come back to you and ask you about the um, opportunity set in CLO AAAs. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the um, the arbitrage for CLOs is is um, is challenged at the moment. Um, but how does um, how does a AAA investment look for your seat in terms of relative value versus other AAA rated products? And where do you see demand coming from? Could it be increasing or decreasing? Uh, say from investors such as US or Japanese banks what do you what are you seeing in the AAA market currently yeah uh, so it, it kind of depends your starting point Hugh um, we argue very strongly from a portfolio construction process if you have zero floating rate product in your portfolio even adding 10 to 20 percent really can help you get closer to that efficient frontier. Uh, we've written a white paper on this, and it's it's very simple, right? When you're looking at a factor-based analysis, for fixed income in particular, uh, your first factor is duration, right? And so what we often see is clients with three or four or five different fixed income um, ETFs or, or funds in their portfolio, and they're all based a benchmark to the egg. They all have like five to seven type year duration. And so they're very highly correlated to each other. Yeah, one manager might be slightly better than the other, but you're not talking drastic changes in, in types of performance versus obviously a floating rate product um, will have very different drivers, right? Because you take out that duration component. And that, that was obviously seen last year where most, um, ag benchmark uh, fixed income portfolios were down double digits, somewhere between 10 and 15%. And JAAA, our AAA CLO ETF, was actually positive on the year um, by about 55 basis points. So um, that was a huge step in the right direction. So first and foremost, if you have a cash plus type bucket, obviously a AAA CLO ETF is not cash. It's not T-bills. It's not uh, a, a bank CD. But if you can take a little bit more volatility and you have that bucket for cash, um, we think it's a great place to be invested. Um, uh, likewise, if you have a portfolio of fixed income and you have an egg product or maybe a global product, maybe a muting product, and you have nothing that's floating rate, um, we would strongly recommend uh, JAAA. 
particularly, or if you do have a floating rate product and it's deep in credit, like a leverage loan type ETF, we think going up in credit makes a lot of sense. And then finally, uh, you know, just based on other asset classes, we still think CLOs make a lot of sense versus corporate credit. Corporate credit's held in very well this year. It's starting to show a little bit of cracks in the last month or so, particularly in the high yield, low investment grade area. But uh, we think there will be more to come as the economy here in the U.S. slows down. Um, and then versus other securitized, maybe not quite as strong recommendation. Agency mortgages, um, incredibly cheap right now. Um, and a lot of areas of securitized are, are very, very cheap. Most of that is technicals, actually. But um, CLOs still look decent, but maybe not the table pounding we would give versus the the other things I mentioned. Uh, Megan and Matt, you you as you said earlier, don't don't do don't play so much in the AAA part of the CLO structure. But um, what's your outlook for CLO AAAs, and what are you hearing about um, you know potential demand and how the investor base has shifted? But Megan, do you want to start with that? Um, so the investor base has certainly shifted in terms of growth. I think that, um, some of the larger, you know, money center banks will come back to the market. I think it's a matter of time and, and when, you know, they are able to, um, uh, take on risk again. Um, I think that the regulations, especially Basel three will help with that. Um, and certainly the floating rate nature um, of AAAs, I think, will be um, additive to the portfolio to bank portfolios again. Um, as far as spreads, I mean, that's <laughs> that that's a tough one, right? I mean, there's really no rhyme or reason. Um, talk about technicals. Um, CLO AAAs are are very very technical. It's a supply and demand game. Um, so I think that again, we'll widen into the end of the year. We're wider now. We're probably about ten, in some cases, twenty basis points wider in the last eight weeks. Um, and uh, I think in the new year, we'll probably see some tightening based on you know new money uh, to put to work. I think AAAs are um, certainly not as cheap as John mentioned to some some of the other um, structured finance um, instruments, um, but over seven percent for a AAA, um, you know, I'll say unbreakable, but uh, you know, the 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 proof is there. Um, is I mean, is great. I would buy. You know, I'm I'm I want to buy John's fund into my PA. Thank <laughs> you, Megan. Uh, Matt, any more any uh, thoughts on that? No, I think um, in terms of in terms of the AAA, there's clearly a lot of lot of focus focus on that. I'll um, I'll save save my breath for um, for the other tranches as we as we move as we move the conversation forward. Sure. Um, so maybe maybe we'll talk about equity next. Um, uh, Matt, I can start with you on that one. Um, how again? How does the opportunity set for CLO equity look? And um, in particular, um, I want to talk about the rise of um, managers' captive equity funds and how you think that's um, what impact you think that's had on the market because it's been uh, getting quite a lot of publicity this year. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, so CLO equity at the moment, I think, I think I'll just um, back up a little bit and, you know, effect effectively the way the way I view the market is you've got almost 50-50 Fifty percent of the market primary, fifty percent of the transactions in the secondary market. So primary equity is five to ten percent of overall paper traded across across the CLO market. It gets about ninety percent of the of, of of the airtime, which I think is an over. Um, now, if you look across all the other primary tranches, double Bs, triple Bs, all the way up to John's triple As, and then you come back down, cap, come back down the capital structure in 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 the secondaries. Actually. The returns today are as attractive and as high across pretty much all of the tranches as they've ever been. OK, there's some relative value. Triple B's are looking great at the moment. You can make an 8% portfolio out of a out of a solid. And I'm not cherry picking here and just going for the riskiest. You can make an 8% portfolio out of out of out of triple B's. Um, you know, absolutely fantastic. Double B's, you know, well um, sort of spoken about, communicated, but across the double B range at the moment anywhere from 13 to 16 percent there's some hairier stuff that's in, in in the high teens where you're covered 
you know, there's there's some relative there's decent NAVs in 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 the equity, and I'm talking about the secondary market here. Your entry price is is somewhere in the low 90s, sometimes the high 80s, depending on the coupon and the duration. So you've got this this pull to par effect that's coming through, especially as loans are now paying down again. Um, you've got a pull to par capital appreciation and a great running yield that's going forward. And you're actually able to extract as much from a from a double B portfolio. And, or even higher returns from that double B portfolio as w- to what long-term CLO equity has provided. So that's kind of where we are today, and that's really attractive. Now, as you then go further down into the capital structure, into CLO equity, um, you know, in the secondary market, last couple of days, we've seen 100 million come out on, on lists and BWIX as, as we go through post through that October coupon payment. Um, there's a lot of buyers, there's a lot of sellers, um, there's a lot of you know, established pricing. It's not a price discovery. Um, covers are very, very tight when we're trading in in, in, in in this market. It's not like it's you and one other guy and you might be five points apart. That's simply not the case. You know, it's a bidding process and and it's 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 incrementally sort of executed. So it's very, very interesting. And then looking at returns across CLO equity in the secondary market, and I'll stick with the secondary market for now. You, here you can sort of see Anything for the longer profiles and the tier one managers, 15 to 16%. But certainly as you look at the tiering, tier two managers, and here we're saying effectively, you're not tiering necessarily by performance. You know, the tiering is a is a strange animal. You see it at the triple A's as well. Um, sometimes the tightest execution is not to the best managers, exactly the same as how equity trades as well. It's familiarity of name and so on and so forth. But for guys who are set up to analyze the portfolios and to be able to trade in the in in the in the secondary market, there's great value, and there can be four to four points of IRR from an equivalent CLO equity just with a an average manager. We call it tier two, but you know, I I, I think I think that's um it's it's not it's not the right way to phrase it. And then you've got this other profile of CLO equity as well. And this is a really interesting thing about CLOs: primary market, secondary markets, seven tranches in each. Duration, looking at different vintages, um, you know, there's deals that we look at that have been out there since 2013. There's deals that we look at that were issued like, you know, last week and we're looking at the primary deals as well today. There's so many different ways for you to express your views on credit, floating rate credit across CLOs, different return profiles, different durations, again, vintages you know, um, level of level of risk in the underlying portfolios. And you can really, you know, it's quite, ex- I, I actually genuinely think this is a really exciting period. Like if you go in back to where we are on default rates, default rates, roughly 1.3%. Your loss ratio would equate, would equate to somewhere around two and a half percent in a, in a, in a, in a 75 recovery market. Okay. Like as in terms of where we are today to break a CLO double B, you need 7% defaults within that CLO year after year after year after year. Like you're buying a primary, you're buying an old secondary. You are, you are, you are, unless you make a disastrous error in your underwriting, you are going to get your principal back and you're going to earn a very elevated yield going forward. It's really exciting, exciting period. This is not like when we were in COVID and businesses were on zero revenue models and we didn't know what next year was going to look like. Okay. If next year looks a bit worse than this year, I think we've we've we all model downside scenarios way worse than that, and mm. our portfolios are are well, you know, are doing fine in that in that type of environment. So, returns returns relative value, um, absolute returns, and uh, you know, relative value is an interesting. But I think just look at the absolute returns of where we are today. Cash deployed today and really in the last two years, you are going to make a very very good return with a you know a decent degree of certainty of your of your outcome across across the CLO cap stack. Thanks Matt. Uh, Megan, do you have anything to add to that or anything Matt said you want to respond to? Um I just want to actually um just um highlight something that Matt said that I think it's lost on a lot of people. Um when he said defaults year after year after year, when we're stressing CLOs, it's not one year of high defaults. It's constant default rates. Um mm-hmm. so you know, uh, it would have to be 
high level of default every single year that the um, that the CLO is outstanding, um, which is obviously a very punitive way of looking and, and very unlikely to happen. Go ahead, Matt. Can I just, yeah, on that, really what you're talking about, Megan, is, and I know, I know, I know this is the point you're making, you, you need a level of default seen in 2009 the peak of the financial crisis like covid was was half of that that's the that's the scale of defaults that you need over over these consecutive years sorry didn't mean to yeah. interrupt no it's just a great point because it, it really does get kind of lost um because you know the wider um you know it, investor base is not uh it, it is really not as um used to this constant default rate um idea um it's more about just like defaults one year and how is that going to infect clos um so um in clos when we stress whether it be new issues or looking at secondary um you, we're stressing them um very punitively um including default rates at a constant basis um so hugh i think the question was equity right um <laughs> i we um so i think uh the one thing that i'll say um this we could go on and on about this i think that the market the clo market has evolved when it comes to equity and i don't think we can look at clos as an arbitrage product only anymore and i it's kind of like uh, it, it's a bit of a thorn in my side when I see these kind of salacious headlines saying, you know, CLO ARB lowest in history. Um, it's not about the ARB um, when you are able to buy high quality portfolios at a discount. Um, it's about certainly um, a, a relatively high cash on cash return um, that happens immediately and pays quarterly. But it's also about, you know, total return, which we've never had in the past. Um, so, uh, you know, you can buy a portfolio um, at 97 today. And if you are the control equity, which um, to your point about captive equity funds, which is another term that, that I don't like, but um, I'll call them dedicated funds um, where you work the control equity, the fund is the control equity. You own two very valuable options. You own the option to call the deal at the, at the soonest call date, typically two years, could be shorter, um, or refinance your cost of debt. So both of those valuable options um, are uh, just going to increase the return to equity. Um, and so the, the pull to par um, buying the portfolio at a discount and potentially um, calling the deal um, at uh, a, uh, a principal um, gain, um, along with the high cash on cash returns on a quarterly basis, makes CLO equity attractive today. Thank you. Um, so a number of you have already touched on this point, but it's um, a New territory for the CLO market is the fact that since the October payment date, um, I think 40% of uh, CLOs are now out of their reinvestment periods. Um, John, I want to get your thoughts on um, just the the fact of that, really, and some of the activity that you're seeing, the call activity that um, there is, and how do you think differently about a CLO investment that's in a reinvesting CLO versus a post-reinvestment CLO? Yeah, this we could talk about this for a very long time, but uh, just so people on the call who maybe aren't as familiar with the market is the, the usual structure is a two-year non-call, five-year reinvestment. So after five years doesn't mean that the CLO manager can't do any reinvestment, but there are there is language in the docs and normally the deal starts to factor down and the AAAs start to factor down. Um, we take this very seriously as far as the analysis that we do for our portfolios in JAAA or JAAA or ETF, simply because we want to maximize convexity as much as possible. What does that mean? I mean, very simply, it means when you have a AAA CLO that's trading at 96, 97, 98 cents on the dollar, and you know that it's not going to default um, because no AAA CLO has ever defaulted. Um, and that it will have this pull to par that's very powerful, um, particularly in total return basis. And that, that's why even though we're paying out something like six and a half percent distribution yield, that's just your dividends every month, you have a yield to worth that's higher than that closer to seven because you're getting this pull to par. Currently, JAAA um, has less um, in, that is out of the reinvestment period than the index. Right now, JAAA is about 9% that 
that's out of the reinvestment period and um, the benchmark, uh, which is the J, uh, JP Morgan CLO Chloe index has about 23%. Um, another way to think about this is just maturity. Uh, JAAA for zero to three years is 30%. The index is 70%, so much shorter uh, for the index. Uh, for three to five years, JAAA is 58%. The index is 14%. And then for greater than five years, um, we're a little closer at 11% with the index at 16%. So the question is, why are we more in the three to five year portion versus you know, shorter or longer? And really, um, the idea is that um, the shorter part of the curve we don't love because um, the CPRs or the prepayments that are coming in, normally the market uh, uses a 20 CPR. That just means like 20% of loans will prepay every year, more or less. Um, we think that's actually going to be slower um, and that the convexity or the dollar price of that three to five year bucket is very, very strong because those were issued basically in 2021 when spreads were very, very tight. So those spreads, now that spreads have widened, dollar prices have gone down. So I know there's a lot of numbers and for most people probably aren't following it, but what we're trying to do, obviously, use active management, increase the convexity of the portfolio. And right now we see that not in the short end, not really in the long end, but kind of in that middle three to five year part of the weighted average life curve. And that's where we're overweight. Uh, Megan, do you have anything to um, add to that on deals post reinvestment? Um, not a lot. I think John covered a lot of it. Um, I agree that prepayment uh, rates will be slower um, uh, and, and therefore your deals will amortize uh, more slowly. Um, you know, I think uh, it'll be interesting to see actually what the effect is on the loan market uh, with, you know, uh, decreased demand from CLOs. Um, I think that's kind of where I'm most focused. Uh, Matt, any thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of um, people will look at a look at a CLO that's going out of its reinvestment period and think, oh, it's got it's gone static. You know, this is actually. But to John's point around the convexity, you can see a very clear path on how this pull to par effect is, is, is going to go through. And there's some real great, great value to be had here. Um, and what's really interesting, this is possibly one of the most fascinating periods of the CLO level loan market and how they interact with each other. You've got 25% of the loan market is going to mature um, by the end of 2026. You've got 40% of CLOs coming out of reinvest now. Uh, we did a paper on this this time last year, which we distributed to our, our investors. Now, these loans, the vast majority of these loans that are coming up to mature, 98% of them every year are going to find a way to refinance. They are. And in some and in some cases, our, our, our cousins over in the private credit market, they've even helped take out some of these stuck syndications. We've got loans trading at 80 where the BSL market doesn't want them. Private credit have come and taken them out. We will take that par back all day long. That's a fantastic outcome for us. But on the whole, internally within our market, we don't have any supply coming from the primary loan market at the moment, which makes sense in this environment. LBO M&A activity. If you're trying to sell a business, you want 2021's valuation. If you want to buy a business, you want to pay 2023's valuation. The bid offer is massive, plus interest rates are up, so your financing costs. So you're not getting a lot, a lot of activity apart from add-ons and things. So these CLOs that are going out of their reinvestment period, what it means is on the whole, they can do a little bit, but on the whole, the loans that are maturing are... They, they're sort of saying, look, we can't take this. We, we we have to take back part. Whereas you've got all these reinvesting CLOs that don't have any loans coming from the primary market that says, we need paper. We'll take that paper. And the average, the average A to E transaction that we see at the moment is around 91 basis points wider. That's great for first and foremost for the CLO equity, like spreads, we're seeing them incrementally widening across, across the pool. Um, but it also helps everybody else because that loan that was trading, say, a year ago in the low mid-90s, it's a performing loan. You've had a five-point uptick 
which has helped your NAV for all, all of the debt tranches as well as the equity. You've got a spread takeout. And if you're in a CLO that is still reinvesting, you've got a loan that now trades well in the secondary market on the whole, somewhere around par, because it's, it's priced like a new issue loan. It's priced like a loan that's designed to service a 175, 180 AAA and you know, wherever the capital structure is today. It's not like you know you've just taken out a what was a LIBOR plus three twenty five and replaced it with that. You know you're, you're you're increasing your spread, so it's a really interesting dynamic, shortening the duration of these post reinvestment CLOs, and we're starting to see more CLOs now, older vintage CLOs actually getting called. It's a handful at the moment. I think we've just had eight, and some of those were twenty twenty two deals as well, where people have like Megan just described. They've done great. They bought par. Uh, you know, basically par portfolios at 96 and they've liquidated those and 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 stepped out. That. That's that's worked really, really well. But you're also seeing this benefit in across some of the old the old legacy, the legacy CLOs as well. And this this pull to par effect that's coming through in the in the in the in 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 the junior junior mes tranches. It's a really interesting dynamic. And it's actually happened before. Like if we go back to 2019, we had a 2010 maturity war. That was in a world where there was no CLO issuance. Forget about the 272 deals we've had this year and, you know, it's down a bit off last year. Like credit crunch, crisis, nothing. It's frozen markets, okay? And we had uh, like 15 to 20% of the loan market at that time was due to mature. They all came back and did A2Es. And people kind of, you know, they, oh, they kicked the can, they kicked the can. They paid fees. Borrowers paid fees. They paid spread. And sometimes back in those days and less now, you got improvements to documentations, covenant, covenant resets and that kind of kind of stuff. You know, they came back and they paid up for that as well. Like the 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 the, the those equities that were issued in 2006, especially 2007, ended up being some of the best ever vintage because they came out of that period of A to E spread widening with higher NAVs. They were buying distress loans as well at, at, at that time or par loans at dislocated prices. But with this super cash on cash that was kind of running at 20, 25%, that was a great vintage. It's less pronounced this cycle, but we're seeing the same mechanics happening again. Um, and I think like as we go into 2024, we're going to see more and more CLOs getting called. And also what that does all the way from the triple A's down to, down to equity everywhere it just breaks the inertia a little bit. AAA guys, you know, they want to stay in CLOs. They're going to come back into the market and it breaks the cycle and it just it just kind of oils, oils the chain a little bit. So this this dynamic around, you know, loans, you know, we do have maturities coming up. That's that's what loans do. They mature. And we do have CLOs coming out of reinvestment period. That's what they do. They come out of reinvestment period. That's kind of normal because the alternative is or was everything just gets reset and extended and extended indefinitely. And you look at the CLOs that have had two or three resets, like that's not, that's not natural. Those CLOs, one reset, maybe two, at some point they should be called, those loans should come back into the market. And I think there's been a delay on that. That, that, that was the natural. And I think through 2024, 2025, that's what we're gonna see. More deals getting liquidated, loans coming back into the into the market providing supply via the secondary market because i don't think primary loan issuance is necessarily going to pick up next year and and there's going to be clos warehouses and so on and so forth who, who want to trade that that's a really great point matt I'm, I'm sorry Hugh. i just i just want to i want to say they having to come back to market um through refinancing amend and extend or maturity coming um, it, it really marks the company back to market um, rather than staying in the portfolio, right? Um, and uh, that's that's powerful. It goes where it should go. And if you look at, you know, this, again, headlines, right? Um, huge shift from broadly syndicated to private credit market. Actually, no, not really. Um, and if you look at those names and, and we have to stop looking at things in broad strokes, right? It's credit. It's all about the details. So 13, 14 names have moved over to private credit, all of them are either triple C or B3. Um, yeah. And the reason why they're going to the private credit market for the most part is because they don't have a home in broadly syndicated because CLOs are over 70% of the market and CLOs don't wanna own. They, they're not, CLOs are not adding triple Cs 
And for the most part, if you were B3 and on negative watch, you're considered a triple C anyway. Um, so, you know, CLOs are not looking to add risk right now. Um, and so they're going to those, these names are going to the private credit market because they have to. And also, you know, they're looking for different terms that they're not going to get in the broadly syndicated market either. So all of this will kind of normalize, but I think the private credit market has been a great thing for companies who are unable to access the capital markets in a traditional way. So I want to take some of the audience questions. Um, so the first one is a, a, um, a little long, but I'll, um, I've, I've read it, I'll shorten it uh, somewhat. So um, the global financial crisis was a systemic crisis, not a credit crisis. Uh, the Fed is likely to hold interest rates at a 22%, 20, sorry, 22 year high later today. Uh, Hugh, you just mentioned that the cost of debt has increased, interest coverage ratios have fallen and chapter 11 filings are up 90%. Um, Add to the large maturity wall around the corner in 2024 and 2025. The question is, if we come across a credit crisis, how are CLOs positioned to withstand the pain? How will OC tests help protect their integrity? Uh, and does I, anyone want to... I think, Matt, I, go ahead. I think we've actually tackled yeah. all of these in, in point. Like, again, less than 1% of CLOs have, are, are breaching their, their OC test after, you know, this big hype... Uh, hiking hiking rates that's that's come through the shock is now behind us the rate height shock is now behind us um you know the hold at 22 year highs yeah i mean the bigger issue is this is if it goes higher if it if it holds then that's 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 the status quo defaults are or uh, chapter 11 filings are up 90 percent 2021 there was zero there was zero defaults so anything you do there you know, you add, you go from one default to two, you've doubled your default rate. Like the default rate and the loss rate is still somewhere around or below the long-term average. So does it go higher? Potentially it does. Um, but I think it's certainly within the the realms of, of, of exactly what CLOs are designed to withstand. Newer equities, longer uh, reinvestment period equities in that kind of environment, in a difficult environment, they are just going to build par. They're going to buy par loans at 94, 95, 96. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I, like all of these, all of these points are true. I think we've taken them um, on board throughout this. So I think, you know, we've, we've registered all, all of these concerns, but just shown how the CLO structure. And I think the main thing is, it's not, you know, managers, good managers, bad managers, it's the CLO structure that really has kind of, you know, allowed us to weather this, 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 oh, and I'm not even going to say storm because, you know, it's slightly, in, it's inclement weather. That's where we are at the moment. Um, you know, can it deteriorate next, next year, the macro environment? It can, but we're at a pretty decent footing as we've, out, as we've outlined today to be able to withstand incrementally worse environment through 2024, 2025. You can I just add on to that? Um, look, it, these are all great points um, that Matt's making. And it's funny how often when I'm out there talking about CLOs that the yeah, but question comes up. Yeah, but the GFC securitized it terribly and it's going to do poorly again when we go through another downturn. Um, you know, we've had 13 years and we've had COVID and we've had other downturns and securitized actually, particularly CLOs performed quite well during the GFC even, and have performed very, very well um, over the last 13 years in the rating agencies, even increased credit enhancement after the GFC um, to make up for the volatility. So look, I know a lot of people on this call don't spend their lives looking at CLOs or, or credit like uh, the panel does. You're hearing a lot of numbers, you're hearing a lot of acronyms. What I think you got to keep the picture in your mind is of the duck, right? Like the duck is just swimming very steadily across the pond and underneath its legs are going 100 miles an hour. Like we're the legs of the duck, right? We're out there. Uh, Megan's looking at credit. Uh, Matt is looking at structures down the capital stack. We have JAAA at the top of the capital stack, JBBB JBB for the B part of the capital stack. But you have, the, again, that three levels layers of protection. You have the CLO manager looking at credits. You have the structure like Matt mentioned, and then you have the ETF manager here at Janice Henderson trying to protect you. So I get the yeah, but questions for sure. But if nothing else you're getting from this, that 
these products are very stable and you have a lot of protection and I'd be, there are very good, you know, leverage loan managers out there, but particularly if you are concerned about the rates affecting companies, get out of, you know, leverage loan funds or ETFs and go into CLOs where you have this protection, particularly at the top of the capital stack, you should be very safe. So there's um there's two can people. I just, can I, can I just add, sorry, oh, ahead, if, I can, if I can just add to that. So um, we we did a research of all the CLOs outstanding through the GSC and through through COVID, and taking the most junior debt tranche throughout those. And in terms of principal loss, I'm not talking about deals that breached an OC test. You know that's that's not a loss. That's what a CLO is designed to do to self heal, self correct internalize the cash flows rather than let them leak out looking at the most junior tranche whether or not that's a double b or a single b throughout both of those periods gfc covid the default rate across the most junior principal loss rate was less than one percent across the most junior tranche that's pretty incredible for a sub you know deeply subordinated uh, you know ig sub ig tranche um it just goes to show i think how resilient these these structures really are there's two people in the Q and A asking about default rates. Um, I'll I'll just take one of them because the question is very similar. Uh, what's the current default rates in each credit rating, and with the shift in the framework that's already being considered in the current credit analysis from the rating agencies? Um, Megan, would you want to take that one? Um. So I'm assuming that they're talking about the underlying loans. Um. So I mean, uh. So Matt already. Um talked about default rates at 1.3% currently. I mean, you, do we think that defaults are um, on the rise? Yes, certainly. Um, but I think that again, you know, diving into the details, um, when you're looking at defaults, you're looking at losses, you're even looking at recovery rates, you have to look at sector industry and company. It's, you can't, you can't look at this broad strokes across the market, because if you look at the defaults that have happened already, a lot of them are repeats. Um, the issuers have defaulted before, um, and they've defaulted again, um, and they tend to be clumped into uh, uh, the same industries and sectors. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that, that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, they'll say, if defaults are 5% next year, that means that 95% of the loan market is potentially investable. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have to kind of, uh, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You have to um, obviously be manager matters here. Um, and so you want to be investing with a manager um, that certainly has a very long experience managing through stress. And, and that's not the case with everyone, right? Um, there are about 150 managers globally um, and many are new. Um, and, uh, you know, we haven't gone through a real credit cycle. You know, the, the, uh, um, the stress and distress cycles that we've seen have been just that. Um, and so uh, I think it's important to focus on the manager, the experience, the workout experience, and the access to information. So um, uh, firms that have multiple lines of businesses um, that have uh, that are focused on credit across the board, not just loans, not just CLOs. Um, all of those things are important, but uh, realizing kind of being a contrarian, but also realizing that there's opportunity when there's volatility in the market and finding out where those opportunities are, that's the recipe for success. Thank you. There's, there's more questions in the Q&A, but unfortunately we've, um, we've run out of time today. Um, Matt, uh, John and Megan, thank you so much for joining um, Reorg's first uh, CLO webinar. I really enjoyed this discussion. I, uh, yes, uh, uh, look forward. Uh, thanks everyone who signed up. Um, and we look forward to seeing you for the next one.